Chapter Twenty One of A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interlocutory proceedings. A big summer's work lay before us when Uncle Lance realized the permanent loss of three men from the working force of Las Palomas. He rallied to the situation. The ranch would have to run a double outfit the greater portion of the summer and men would have to be secured to fill our ranks. White men who are willing to isolate themselves on a frontier ranch were scarce, but the natives, when properly treated, were serviceable and, where bred to the occupation and inclined to domesticity, made ideal vaqueros. My injured foot improved slowly, and as soon as I was able to ride, it fell to me, to secure the extra help needed. The desertion of quail and cotton had shaken my employer's confidence to a noticeable degree, and in giving me my orders to secure vaqueros, he said, Tom, you take a good horse and go down the Tarancalis and engage five vaqueros. Satisfy yourself that the men are fit for the work, and hire every one by the year. If any of them are in debt, a hundred dollars is my limit of advance money to free them. And hire no man who has no family, for I'm losing confidence every minute in single ones, especially if they are white. We have a few empty wakals, and the more children that I see running naked about the ranch, the better it suits me. I'll never get my money back in building that cotton cottage until I see a mother, even though she is a Mexican, standing in the door with a baby in her arms. The older I get, the more I see my mistake in depending on the white element. I was gone some three days in securing the needed help. It was a delicate errand, for no ranchero liked to see people leave his lands, and it was only where I found men unemployed that I applied for and secured them. We sent wagons from Las Palomas after their few effects and had all the families contentedly housed, either about the headquarters or at the outlying ranchitas, before the first contingent of beeves was gathered. But the attempt to induce any of the new families to occupy the stone cottage proved futile, as they were superstitious. There was a belief among the natives, which no persuasion could remove, regarding houses that were built for others and never occupied. The new building was tendered to Tio Tribucio and his wife, instead of their own palisaded wakal, but it remained tenantless, an eyesore to its builder. Near the latter end of April, a contract was let for two new tanks on the Gonzo grant of land. Had it not been for the sale of beef, which would require our time the greater portion of the summer, it was my employer's intention to have built these reservoirs with the ranch help. But with the amount of work we had in sight, it was decided to let the contract to parties who made it their business and were outfitted for the purpose. Accordingly, in company with the contractor, Uncle Lance and myself spent the last few days of the month laying off and planning the reservoir sites on two small tributaries which formed the Gonzo. We were planning to locate these tanks several miles above the juncture of the small rivulets, and as far apart as possible. Then the first rainfall, which would make running water, would assure us a year's supply on the extreme southwestern portion of our range. The contractor had a big outfit of oxen and mules, and the conditions called for one of the reservoirs to be completed before June 15th. Thus, if rains fell when they were expected, one receptacle, at least, would be in readiness. When returning one evening from starting the work, we found Tony Hunter a guest of the ranch. He had come over for the special purpose of seeing me, but as the matter was not entirely under my control, my employer was brought in to the consultation. In the docket for the May term of court, the divorce proceedings between Esther and Jack Oxenford would come up for a hearing at Oakville on the 7th of the month. Hunter was anxious, if possible, 
to have all his friends present at the trial. But dates were getting a little close, for our first contingent of beeves was due on the coast on the 20th, and to gather and drive them would require not less than ten days. A cross bill had been filed by Oxenford's attorney at the last hour, and a fight was going to be made to prevent the decree from issuing. The judge was a holdover from the Reconstruction regime, having secured his appointment through the influence of congressional friends, one of whom was the uncle of the junior stage man. Unless the statutory grounds were clear, there was a doubt expressed by Esther's attorney whether the court would grant the decree. But that was the least of Hunter's fears, for in his eyes the man who would willfully abuse a woman had no rights in court or out. Tony, however, had enemies, for he and Oxford had had a personal altercation, and since the separation the Martin family had taken the side of Jack's employer and severed all connections with the ranch. That the male contractors had the village of Oakville under their control, we all agreed, as we had tested that on our return from Fort Worth the spring before. In all the circumstances, though Hunter had no misgivings as to the ultimate result, yet being a witness and accused of being the main instigator in the case, he felt that he ought, as a matter of precaution, to have a friend or two with him. "'Well now, Tony,' said my employer, "'this is crowding the mourners just a trifle. But Las Palomas was never called on in a good cause, but she could lend a man or two even if they had to get up from the dinner table and go hungry. I don't suppose the trial will last over a day or two at the furthest, and even if it did, the boys could ride home in the night. In our first bunch, and in half a day, we'll gather every beef in two rodeos and start that evening. Steamships won't wait, and if we were a day behind time, they might want to hold out demurge on us. If it wasn't for that, the boys could stay a week, and you would be welcome to them. Of course, Tom will want to go, and about the next best man I could suggest would be June. I'd like the best in the world to go myself, but you see how I'm situated, getting these cattle off and a new tank building at the same time. Now, you boys make your own arrangements among yourselves, and this ranch stands ready to back up anything you say or do. Tony remained overnight, and we made arrangements to meet him, either at Shepherd's the evening before, or in Oakville on the morning of the trial. Owing to the behavior of Quail and Cotton, none of us had attended the celebration of San Jacinto Day at the ferry. Nor had anyone from the Vox or McLeod ranches, for while they did not understand the situation, it was obvious that something was wrong, and they had remained away, as did Las Palomas. But several of Hunter's friends from the San Miguel had been present, and likewise had Oxenford, and reports came back to the ranch of the latter's conduct and of certain threats he had made when he found there was no one present to resent them. The next morning before starting home, Tony said to our Segundo and myself, then I'll depend on you, too. I may have a few other friends who'll want to attend. I don't need very many for a coward like Jack Oxenford. He is perfectly capable of abusing an unprotected woman or an old man if he had a crowd of friends behind him to sick him on. Oh, he's a cur, all right, for when I told him that he was whelped under a house, he never resented it. He loves me all right, or has good cause to. Why, I bent the cylinder pin on a new six-shooter over his head when he had a gun on him, and he forgot to use it. I don't expect any trouble, but if you don't look a sneaking cur right in the eye, he may slip up behind and bite you. After making arrangements to turn in two hundred beeves on our second contingent and send a man with them to the coast, Hunter returned home. There was no special program for the interim until gathering the beeves commenced, yet on a big ranch like Las Palomas there is always work. While Deweese finished 
curbing the well in which Ortiz had lost his life, I sawed off and cut new threads on all the rods and piping belonging to that particular windmill. With a tireless energy for one of his years, Uncle Lance rode the range until he could have told at a distance one half his holdings of cattle by flesh marks alone. A few days before the date set for the trial, Enrique brought in word one evening that an outfit of strange men were encamped north of the river on the Gonzo track. The vaquero was unable to make out their business, but he was satisfied they were not there for pleasure. So my employer and I made an early start the next morning to see who the campers were. On the extreme northwestern corner of our range, fully twenty-five miles from headquarters, we met them and found they were a corps of engineers running a preliminary survey for a railroad. They were in the employ of the International and Great Northern Company, which was then contemplating extending their line to some point on the Rio Grande. While there was nothing definite in this prior survey, it sounded a note of warning, for the course they were running would carry the line up the Gonzo on the south side of the river, passing between the new tanks and leaving our range through a sag in the hills on the south end of the Grant. The engineer in charge very courteously informed my employer that he was under instructions to run from San Antonio to different points on the river, three separate lines during the present summer. He also informed us that the other two preliminary surveys would be run farther west, and there was a possibility that Las Palomas lands would be missed entirely, a prospect that was very gratifying to Uncle Lance. Tom, said he, as we rode away, I've been dreading this very thing for years. It was my wish that I would never live to see the necessity of fencing our lands, and today a railroad survey is being run across Las Palomas. I had hoped that when I died, this valley would be an open range and as primitive as the day of my coming to it. Here a railroad threatens our peace, and the signs are on every hand that we'll have to fence to protect ourselves. But let it come, for we can't stop it. If I'm spared within the next year, I'll secure every tract of land for sale adjoining the ranch if it cost me a dollar an acre. Then if it comes to the pinch, Las Palomas will have, for all time, land and to spare. You haven't noticed the changes in the country, but nearly all this chaparral has grown up, and the timber is twice as heavy along the river as when I first settled here. I hate the sight even of a necessity like a windmill, and God knows we have no need of a railroad. To a ranch that doesn't sell fat beeves over once in ten years, transportation is the least of its troubles. About dusk on the evening of the day preceding the trial, June Deweese and I rode into Shepherd's, expecting to remain overnight. Shortly after our arrival, Tony Hunter hastily came in and informed us that he had been unable to get hotel accommodations for his wife and Esther in Oakville, and had it not been that they had old friends in the village, all of them would have had to return to the ferry for the night. These friends of the McLeod family told Hunter that the stage people had coerced the two hotels into refusing them, and had otherwise prejudiced the community in Oxenford's favor. Hunter had learned also that the junior member of the stage firm had collected a crowd of hangers-on, and being liberal in the use of money, had convinced the rabble of the village that he was an innocent and injured party. The attorney for Esther had arrived, and had cautioned everyone interested on their side of the case to be reserved and careful under every circumstance as they had a bitter fight on their hands. The next morning all three of us rode into the village. Court had been in session over a week, and the sheriff had sworn in several deputies to preserve the peace, as there was considerable bitterness between litigants outside the divorce case. These undersheriffs made it a point to see that everyone put aside his arms on reaching the town, and tried 
as far as lay in their power, to maintain the peace. During the early days of the Reconstruction regime, before opening the term, the presiding judge had frequently called on the state for a company of Texas Rangers to preserve order and enforce the mandates of the court. But in 79, there seemed little occasion for such a display of force, and a few fearless officers were considered sufficient. On reaching the village, we rode to the house where the women were awaiting us. Fortunately, there was ample corral room at the stable, so we were independent of hostelries and liveries. Mrs. Hunter was the very reverse of her husband, being a timid woman, while poor Esther was very nervous under the dread of the coming trial. But we cheered them with our presence, and by the time court opened, they had recovered their composure. Our party numbered four women and five men. Esther lacked several summers of being as old as her sister, while I was by five years the youngest of the men, and naturally looked to my elders for leadership. Having left our arms at the house, we entered the courtroom in as decorous and well-behaved manner as if it had been a house of worship and this a Sabbath morning. A peculiar stillness pervaded the room, which could have been mistaken as an omen of peace, or the tension similar to the lull before a battle. Personally, I was composed, but as I allowed my eyes from time to time to rest upon Esther, she had never seemed so near and dear to me as in that opening hour of court. She looked very pale, and moved by the subtle power of love, I vowed that should any harm come to, or any insulting words be spoken of her, my vengeance would be sure and swift. Court convened, and the case was called. As might have been expected, the judge held that under the pleadings it was not a jury case. The panel was accordingly excused for the day, and joined those curiously inclined in the main body of the room. The complaining witnesses were called, and under direct examination the essential facts were brought forth, laying the foundation for a legal separation. The plaintiff was the last witness to testify. As she told her simple story, a hush fell over the room, every spectator, from the judge on the bench to the sheriff, being eager to catch every syllable of the recital. But as in duty bound to a client, the attorney for the defendant, a young man, who had come from San Antonio to conduct the case, opened a sharp cross-questioning. As the examination proceeded, an altercation between the attorneys was prevented only by the presence of the sheriff and deputies. Before the inquiry progressed, the attorney for the plaintiff apologized to the court, pleading extenuating circumstances and the offense offered to his client. Under his teachings, he informed the court, the purity of womanhood was above suspicion, and no man who wished to be acknowledged as a gentleman among his equals would impugn or question the statement of a lady. The witness on the stand was more to him than an ordinary client, as her father and himself had been young men together and volunteered under the same flag his friend offering up his life in its defense, and he spared to carry home the news of an unmarked grave on a southern battlefield. It was a privilege to him to offer his assistance and counsel today to a daughter of an old comrade, and anyone who had the temerity to offer an affront to this witness would be held to a personal account for his conduct. The first day was consumed in taking testimony. The defense introduced much evidence in rebuttal. Without regard to the truth or their oaths, a line of witnesses were introduced who contradicted every essential point of the plaintiff's case. When the credibility of their testimony was attacked, they sought refuge in the technicalities of the law, and were supported by rulings of the presiding judge. When Oxenford took the stand in his own behalf, there was not a dozen persons present who believed the perjured statements which fell from his lips. Yet when his testimony was subjected to rigid cross-questioning, every attempt 
to reach the truth precipitated a controversy between attorneys as bitter as it was personal that the defendant at the bar had escaped prosecution for swindling the government out of large sums of money for mail service never performed was well known to everyone present including the judge yet he was allowed to testify against the character of a woman pure as a child while his own past was protected from exposure by rulings from the bench when the evidence was all in court adjourned until the following day that evening our trio after escorting the women to the home of their friend visited every drinking resort hotel and public house in the village meeting groups of oxenford's witnesses even himself as he dispensed good cheer to his henchmen but no one dared to say a discourteous word and after amusing ourselves by a few games of billiards we mounted our horses and returned to the shepherds for the night as we rode along leisurely all three of us admitted misgivings as to the result for it was clear that the court had favored the defense yet we had a belief that the statutory grounds were sufficient and on that our hopes hung the next morning found our party in court at the opening hour the entire forenoon was occupied by the attorney for the plaintiff in reviewing the evidence analyzing and weighing every particle showing an insight into human motives which proved him a master in his profession after the noon recess the young lawyer from the city addressed the court for two hours his remarks running from bombastic to flights of oratory and from eulogies upon this client to praise of the unpeachable credibility of the witnesses for the defense in concluding the older lawyer prefaced his remarks by alluding to the divine intent of the institution of marriage and contending that of the two women were morally the better in showing the influence of the stronger upon the weaker sex he asserted that it was in the power of the man to lift the woman or sink her into despair in his peroration he rose to the occasion and amid breathless silence facing the court who quailed before him demanded whether this was a temple of justice replying to his own interrogatory he dipped his brush in the sunshine of life and sketched a throne with womanhood enshrined upon it while chivalry existed among men it mattered little he said as to the decree of courts for in the higher tribunal human hearts women would remain forever in control at his conclusion women were hysterical and men were aroused from their usual languor by the eloquence of the speaker had the judge rendered an adverse decision at that moment he would have needed protection for to the men of the south it was innate to be chivalrous to womanhood but the court was cautious and after announcing that he would take the case under advisement until morning adjourned for the day all during the evening men stood about in small groups and discussed the trial the consensus of opinion was favorable to the plaintiff but in order to offset public opinion oxford and a squad of his followers made the rounds of the public places offering to wager any sum of money that the decree would not be granted since feeling was running rather high our little party avoided the other faction and as we were under the necessity of riding out to the ferry for accommodation concluded to start earlier than the evening before after saddling we rode around the square and at the invitation of deweese dismounted before a public house for a drink and a cigar before starting we were aware that the town was against us and to maintain a bold front was a matter of necessity unbuckling our belts in compliance with the sheriff's orders we hung our six shooters on the pommels of our saddles and entered the barroom other customers were being waited on and several minutes passed before we were served the place was rather crowded and as we were being waited on a rabble of roughs surged through the rear door led by jack oxenford he walked up to within two feet of me where i stood at the counter 
and apparently addressing the barkeeper, as we were ch charging our glasses, said in a defiant tone, I'll bet a thousand dollars Judge Thornton refuses to grant a separation between my wife and me. The words flashed through me like an electric shock, and understanding the motive, I turned on the speaker and, with the palm of my hand, dealt him a slap in the face that sent him staggering back into the arms of his friends. Never before or since had I felt the desire to take human life which possessed me at that instant. With no means of defense in my possession but a penknife, I backed away from him, he doing the like, and both keeping close to the bar, which was about twenty feet long. In one hand I gripped the open-bladed pocket knife, and, with the other behind my back, retreated to my end of the counter, as did Oxenford to his, never taking our eyes off each other. On reaching his end of the bar, I noticed the barkeeper going through the motions that looked like passing him a gun, and in the same instant some friend behind me laid the butt of a pistol in my hand behind my back. Dropping the knife, I shifted the six-shooter to my right hand, and advancing on the object of my hate, fired in such rapid succession that I was unable to tell whether my fire was being returned. When my gun was empty, the intervening clouds of smoke prevented any view of my adversary. But my lust for his life was only intensified when, on turning to my friends, I saw Deweese supporting Hunter in his arms. Knowing that one or the other had given me the pistol, I begged them for another to finish my work. But at that moment the smoke arose sufficiently to reveal my enemy crippling down at the farther end of the bar a smoking pistol in his hand. As Oxenford sank to the floor, several of his friends ran to his side, and Deweese, noticing the movement, rallied the wounded man in his arms. Shaking him until his eyes opened, June, exultingly, as a savage, cried, Tony, for God's sake, stand up just a moment longer. Yonder he lies. Let me carry you over so you can watch the cur die. Turning to me, he continued, Tom, you got your man. Run for your life. Don't let them get you. Passing out of the house during the excitement, I was in my saddle in an instant, riding like a fiend for shepherds. The sun was nearly an hour high, and with a good horse under me, I covered the ten miles to the ferry in less than an hour. Portions of the route were sheltered by timber along the river, but once, as I crossed a rise opposite a large bend, I sighted a posse in pursuit several miles to the rear. On reaching Shepherd's, fortunately for me, a single horse stood at the hitch rack. The merchant and owner of the horse came to the door as I dashed up, and never offering a word of explanation, I changed horses. Luckily the owner of the horse was Red Ernest, a friend of mine, and feeling that they would not have long to wait for explanations, I shook out the reins and gave him the rowel. I knew the country, and soon left the river road, taking an airline course for Las Palomas, which I reached within two hours after nightfall. In a few profane words I explained the situation to my employer, and asked for a horse that would put the Rio Grande behind me before morning. A number were on picket nearby, and several of the boys ran for the best mounts available. A purse was forced into my pocket, well filled with gold. Meanwhile, I had in my possession an extra six-shooter, and now that I had a moment's time to notice it, recognized the gun as belonging to Tony Hunter. Filling the empty chambers and waving a farewell to my friends, I passed out by the rear and reached the saddle shed where a well-known horse was being saddled by dexterous hands. Once on his back, I soon passed the eighty miles between me and the Rio Grande, which I swam out of my horse the next morning, within an hour after sunrise. End of chapter 21《Chapter 22 of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams》。
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sunset Of my exile of over two years in Mexico, little need be said. By easy stages I reached the haciendas on the Rio San Juan, where we had received the cows in the summer of 77. The reception extended me was all one could ask, but cooled when it appeared that my errand was one of refuge and not of business. I concealed my offense and was given appointment as Corporal Segundo over a squad of vaqueros. But while the hacienda to which I was attached was larger than Las Palomas, with greater holdings in livestock, yet my life there was one of penal servitude. I strove to blot out past memories in the innocent pleasures of my associates, mingling in all the social festivities, dancing with the dark-eyed senoritas, and gambling at every fiesta. Yet in the midst of the dissipation there was ever present to my mind the thought of a girl, likewise, living a life of loneliness at the mouth of the San Miguel. During my banishment, but twice, did any word or message reach me from the Nueces Valley. Within a few months after my locating on the Rio San Juan, Enrique Lopez, a trusted vaquero from Las Palomas, came to the hacienda, apparently seeking employment. Recognizing me at a glance, at the first opportunity, he slipped me a letter unsigned and in an unknown hand. After reading it, I breathed easier, for both Hunter and Oxenford had recovered, the former having been shot through the upper lobe of a lung, while the latter, having sustained three wounds, one of which resulted in the loss of an arm. The judge had reserved his decision until the recovery of both men was assured, but before the final adjournment of court refused the decree, I had had misgivings that this would be the result and the message warned me to remain away, as the stage company was still offering a reward for my arrest. Enrique loitered around the camp several days, and on being refused employment, made inquiry for a ranch in the south and rode away in the darkness of evening. But we had several little chats together, in which the rascal delivered many oral messages, one of which he swore by all the saints had been entrusted to him by my own sweetheart while visiting at the ranch. But Enrique was capable of enriching any oral message, and I was compelled to read between the lines. Yet I hope the saints to whom he daily prayed will blot out any untruthful embellishments. The second message was given me by Frank Nancredi, early in January 81. As was his custom, he was buying saddle horses at Las Palomas during the winter for trail purposes, when he learned of my whereabouts in Mexico. Deweese had given him directions where I could be found, and as the Rio San Juan country was noted for good horses, Nancredi and a companion rode directly from the Nueces Valley to the hacienda where I was employed. They were on the lookout for a thousand saddle horses and after buying two hundred from the ranch where I was employed, secured my services as interpreter in buying the remainder. We were less than a month in securing the number wanted, and I accompanied the herd to the Rio Grande on its way to Texas. Then Creedy offered me every encouragement to leave Mexico, assuring me that Bethel and Oxenford had lost their mail contract between San Antonio and Brownsville and were now operating in other sections of the state. He was unable to give me the particulars, but frauds had been discovered in star route lines, and the government had revoked nearly all mail contracts in southern Texas. The trail boss promised me a job with any of their herds, and assured me that a cowhand of my abilities would never want a situation in the north. I was anxious to go with him, and would have done so, but felt a compunction, which I did not care to broach to him, for I was satisfied that he would not understand. The summer passed, during which I made it a point to meet other drovers from Texas, who were buying horses and cattle. 
from several sources the report of Nancredi that the stage line south from San Antonio was now in new hands was confirmed. One drover assured me that a national scandal had grown out of the star route contracts, and several officials in high authority had been arraigned for conspiracy to defraud. He further asserted that the new contractor was now carrying the mail for ten per cent of what was formerly allowed to Bethel and Oxenford, and making money at the reduced rate. This news was encouraging, and after an exile of over two years and a half, I recrossed the Rio Grande on the same horse on which I had entered. Carefully avoiding ranches where I was known, two short rides put me in Las Palomas, reaching headquarters after nightfall, where, in seclusion, I spent a restless day and night. A few new faces were about the ranch, but the old friends bade me welcome and assured me that my fears were groundless. During the brief time at my disposal, Miss Jean entertained me with numerous disclosures regarding my old sweetheart. The one that both pleased and interested me was that she was contented and happy, and that her resignation was due to religious faith. According to my hostess's story, a camp meeting had been held at Shepherd's during the fall after my banishment by a sect calling themselves predestinarians and I have since learned that a belief in a predetermined state is entertained by a great many good people, and I admit it seemed as if fate had ordained that Esther McLeod and I should never wed. But it was a great satisfaction to know that she felt resigned and could draw solace from a spiritual source, even though the same was denied to me. During the last meeting between Esther and Miss Jean, but a few weeks before, the former had confessed that there was no hope of our ever marrying. As I had not seen my parents for several years, I continued my journey to my old home on the San Antonio River, leaving Las Palomas after nightfall. I passed the McLeod Ranch after midnight, halting my horse to rest. I reviewed the past, and the best reasoning at my command showed nothing encouraging on the horizon. That Esther had sought consolation from a spiritual source did not discourage me, for, under my observation, where it had been put to the test, the love of man and wife overrode it. But to expect this contented girl to renounce her faith and become my wife was expecting her to share with me nothing, unless it was the chance of a felon's cell. And I remounted my horse and rode away under a starry sky somewhat of a fatalist myself. But I derived contentment from my decision, and on reaching home, no one could have told that I had loved and lost. My parents were delighted to see me after my extended absence. My sisters were growing fast into womanhood, and I was bidden the welcome of a prodigal son. During this visit, a new avenue in life opened before me. As through the influence of my eldest brother, I secured a situation with a drover and followed the cattle trail until the occupation became a lost one. My last visit to Las Palomas was during the winter of 1894-95. It lacked but a few months of twenty years since my advent in the Nueces Valley. After the death of Oxenford by smallpox, I had been a frequent visitor at the ranch, business of one nature and another calling me there. But in this last visit, the wonderful changes which two decades had wrought in the country visibly impressed me, and I detected a note of decay in the old ranch. A railroad had been built passing within ten miles of the western boundary line of the Gonzo Grant. The Las Palomas range had been fenced, several large tracts of land having been added after my severing active connections with the ranch. Even the cattle, in spite of all the efforts made for their improvement, were not so good as in the old days of the open range, or before there was a strand of wire between the Nueces and Rio Grande rivers. But the alterations in the country were nothing compared to the changes in my old master and mistress. Uncle Lance 
was nearing his eighty-second birthday. Physically feeble, but mentally as active as the first morning of our long acquaintance, Miss Jean, over twenty years the junior of the ranchero, had mellowed into a ripeness consistent with her days, and in all my aimless wanderings I never saw a brother and sister of their ages more devoted to or dependent on each other. On the occasion of this past visit, I was in the employ of a livestock commission firm. A member of our house expected to attend the cattle convention at Fort Worth in the near future, and I had been sent into the range sections to note the conditions of stock and solicit for my employers. The spring before, our firm had placed 60,000 cattle for customers. Demand continued, and the house had inquiry sufficient to justify them in sending me out to secure, of all ages, not less than a hundred thousand steer cattle. And thus, once more, I found myself a guest of Las Palomas. "'Don't talk cattle to me,' said Uncle Lance. "'When I mention my business, go to June. He'll give you the ages and numbers. And whatever you do, Tom, don't oversell us.' for wire fences have cut us off till it seems like old friends don't want to neighbor any more. In the days of the open range, I used to sell every hoof I had a chance to. But since then, things have changed. Why, only last year, a jury indicted a young man below here on the river for mavericking a yearling and sent him to Huntsville for five years. That's a fair sample of these modern days. There isn't a cowman in Texas today who amounts to a pinch of snuff, but got his start the same way. But if a poor fellow looks out of the corner of his eye now at a critter, they imagine he wants to steal it. Oh, I know them. And the bigger rustlers they were themselves on the open range, the bitterer their persecution of the man who follows their example. June DeWeese was then the active manager of the ranch, and after securing a classification of their saleable stock, I made out a memorandum and secured authority in writing to sell their holdings at prevailing prices for Nueces River cattle. The remainder of the day was spent with my old friends in a social visit, and as we delved into the musty past, the old man's love of the land and his matchmaking instincts constantly cropped out. Tom, said he, in answer to a remark of mine, I was an awful fool to think my experience could be of any use to you boys. Every last rascal of you went off on the trail and left me here with a big ranch to handle. Gallup was no better than the rest, for he kept Julie Wilson waiting until now she's an old maid. Sis here, always called Scales a vagabond but I still believe something could have been made of him with a little encouragement. But when the exodus of the cattle to the north was at its height, he went off with a trail herd just like the rest of you. Then he followed the trail town as a gambler, saved money, and after the cattle driving ended, married an adventuress, and that's the end of him. The lack of a market was one of the great drawbacks to ranching, but when the trail took every hoof we could breed, and every horse we could spare, it also took my boys. Tom, when you get old, you'll understand that all is vanity and vexation of spirit. But I'm perfectly resigned now. In my will, Las Palomas and everything I have goes to Jean. She can dispose of it as she sees fit. And if I knew she was going to leave it to Father Norquin or his successor, my finger wouldn't be raised to stop it. I spent a lifetime of hard work acquiring this land, and now there is no one to care for the old ranch. I washed my hands of it. Knowing the lifetime of self-sacrifice in securing the land of Las Palomas, I sympathized with the old ranchero in his despondency. I never blamed you much, Tom, he resumed after his silence, but there's something about cattle life which I can't explain. It seems to disqualify a man forever making a good citizen afterward. He roams and runs around, wasting his youth, and gets so foxy he never marries. But June and the widow made the rifle finally, I protested. 
Yes, they did, and that's something to the good, but they never had any children. Waited ten years after Anira was killed, and then got married. That was one of Jean's matches. Tom, you must go over and see Joanna before you go. There's a match that I made. Just think of it. They have eight children, and Fidel is prouder over them than I ever was over this ranch. The natives have never disappointed me, but the Caucasians seem to be played out. I remained overnight at the ranch. After supper, sitting in his chair before a cheerful fire, Uncle Lance dozed off to sleep, leaving his sister and myself to entertain each other. I had little to say of my past, and the future was not encouraging, except there was always work to do. But Miss Jean unfolded like the pages of an absorbing chronicle, and gave me the history of my old acquaintances in the valley. Only a few of the girls had married. Frances Vox, after flirting away her youth, had taken the veil in one of the orders in her church. My old sweetheart was contentedly living a life of seclusion on the ranch on which she was born, apparently happy, but still interested in any word of me, in my wanderings. The young men of my acquaintance, except where married, were scattered wide, the whereabouts of nearly all of them unknown. Tony Hunter had held the McLeod estate together, and it had prospered exceedingly under his management. My old friend, Red Ernest, who outrode me in the relay race at the tournament in June 77, was married and serving in the custom service on the Rio Grande as a mounted river guard. The next morning I made the round of the Mexican quarters, greeting my old friends before taking my leave and starting for the railroad. The cottage which had been built for Esther and me stood vacant and windowless, being used only for a storehouse for Zacuista. As I rode away, the sight oppressed me. It brought back the June time of my life, even the hour and instant in which our paths separated. On reaching the last swell of ground, several miles from the ranch, which would give me a glimpse of headquarters, I halted my horse in a farewell view. The sleepy old ranch cozily nested among the Encinal oaks revived a hundred memories, some sad, some happy, many of which have returned in retrospect during lonely hours since. End of chapter 22 End of A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams Recording by Richard Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas